Okay, so let's take a look at motor skill learning. So people learn at different rates and in different ways, and this um, really needs to be taken into consideration when teaching skills. An expert's needs are really different to those of a novice. So we know that. So that's going to affect the way that we um, teach skills, particularly around sport. Um, so Fitz and Posner, these two dudes, um, in 1967 suggested that when we learn something new, we go through a process of moving through specific phases um, as we progress and improve in what we're doing. The three stages that they propose are the cognitive, associative and autonomous stages of learning. So the cognitive stage is characterized by the learners trying to figure out exactly what needs to be done. So there's considerable um, cognitive activity uh, required in this stage. Um, movements are controlled in a, in a relatively conscious manner, so the, the athlete is having to think about it all the time. During this phase, learners often experiment with different strategies to find out which ones work or don't work, or strategies that bring them closer to achieving the goal um, of the movement. Also, learners tend to pay attention to the step-by-step -step execution of the skill, which requires uh, a considerable attention capacity. The result of using these conscious control strategies is that the movement is relatively slow, it's abrupt, inefficient, and the performance is rather inconsistent. Once the learner has acquired um, the basic movement pattern, the second stage, or the associative stage, or phase of learning, um, begins. So this phase is really characterized by more subtle movement adjustments. The movement outcome is more reliable, um, the movements are more consistent, um, and as you progress uh, from trial to trial, they just uh, there's a lot more success. Inefficient movements in the skill uh, are gradually reduced, and, and the athlete becomes more economical or more efficient in what they're trying to do. In addition, parts of the movement controlled more automatically and more attention can be directed to other aspects of performance so they're thinking about what they're doing less and less. After extensive practice the performer reaches the autonomous stage. Now this is characterized by fluent and seamlessly effortless motions. The movements are not only accurate but they have um, very few errors and are very very consistent. Movement production is efficient and requires very little uh, muscular energy and the skill is performed um, largely automatically at, at this stage. So it's, it's um, very little attention required to execu execute the movement. So just uh, breaking down each stage a little bit more, um, the cognitive stage of learning these are the characteristics here, so it's the first stage. Um, throughout this phase, the learner is really trying to create a mental picture. So they're trying to get an idea of what the skill looks like and how they can um, create that movement themselves. So demonstrations and, and verbal explanations are very important because they don't have the, the skill set yet um, and, and it's all new to them. Um, a good way to do this is to provide the learner with um, key cues or, or, or or um, key words that they can use to remind them as they go through and, and, and um, perform the task. Um, a lot of trial and error learning takes place, so um, practicing it and then seeing the mistakes or, or identifying the mistakes and trying again and trying to remove those stakes, mistakes and become more efficient. Um, feedback really important and successes um, need to be reinforced with positive feedback because there is there are going to be a lot of failures at this stage of learning so it's important that we're not beating down on the athlete but we're saying hey you're doing this well um, you could do this a little, little bit better so getting that uh, really working hard to have that sandwich technique of feedback in there and performances are inconsistent and full of errors so practical examples of um, what the stage uh, could look like in a, in a, in a coaching setting so the teacher or the coach might demonstrate the overhead clear um, to a badminton learner and describe two or three coaching points before the learner can have a go at performing it. So they see it in action and they're given a few key cues that they can lock away up here and, and reinforce that as they go through the movement. There's lots of opportunity for the learner to experience a skill, but considerable feedback is given throughout the session. And I mentioned before about that sandwich technique that you can use um, really uh, wrapping uh, a work on with some positive things. <clears throat> learner is given opportunities to rest and think about 
the skill in key cues. So not just saying, hey, here's a demonstration. Here are the key cues. Now go out and, and do this for an hour because, you know, we know that we've already mentioned that there's really high cognitive demand here. So that the athlete has a lot to think about. So we want to give them um, lots of rest uh, and, and intertwine that with, um, uh, with practice. So really a more distributed type of practice. The associative stage of learning, the characteristics, um, uh, that it's quite a long stage. Um, some learners will actually never leave this phase, you know, they'll go on and on and, and won't get to that autonomous stage or phase of learning. Mistakes begin to be, uh, be eliminated, um, so they get better at the skill, and the fundamentals of, of the skill um, uh, are beginning to be mastered by the athlete. Skill becomes more consistent, so less mistakes. Um, it's really getting ingrained, they're getting that groove in. Um, motor programs are developed with subroutines, becoming more coordinated, resulting in the skill becoming smoother, so less choppy and um, uh, you're clunky, I, I guess. Um, and the learner is able to attend to relevant cues, so um, if they are doing the skill and, and the coach or the teacher um, gives them a bit of external feedback, they can address that, they can use those cues and, and identify the mistakes a little bit better and, and make the adjustments needed. Because the learner is really developing the ability to use um, that kinesthetic uh, uh, awareness and feedback to detect some of their own errors, so it makes it easier when they get that feedback from uh, an external coach. So in a practical sense, the performer is getting a really good mental picture of the overhead clear in badminton and has a lot of opportunity to practice it. They're now getting a feel for the shot and it's becoming more fluent and consistent in everything they do. They are starting to become aware of what's right and what's wrong with the shot without being told and can um, begin to attempt and, and often get quite good at attempting to correct any faults that they might have. Mass practice becomes more appropriate in this stage, so giving them um, more opportunity to just practice, practice, practice for, for reasonably, well for medium to long um, periods of time. Um, and saying that that's really important that we are making sure that the technique being used um, during that mass practice is correct. Otherwise, we're going to reinforce um, bad principles or, or bad technique, which is what we're trying to avoid, particularly at this stage. So the, the final stage of learning that we get to is the autonomous stage of learning. So now this is where the learner or the athlete is able to execute the skill with, with minimum conscious thought and can, and, um, can concentrate on other factors um, in that skill or that sport, such as, as, as strategic factors. Um, the badminton example we're using is, is really you know shuttlecock placement or shot selection. It gives them a lot of opportunity to focus on those other, other aspects or components. So this motor program is, is established and, and stored in the long-term memory and it's really ingrained in there. Um, the athlete's self-confidence um, increases and the learner is able to detect errors and correct them. So there's less need for, for external feedback or external credit is given. And it can be much more specific and, and highlight <coughs> excuse me, errors to ensure that um, improvement is always happening. But in saying that improvements in the autonomous stage uh, are quite slow. Um, we're talking at, at that autonomous or, or elite stage, um, athletes looking for, take the 100 metres for example, they're, they're fighting for fractions of seconds um, out of the start blocks and improvement. You know, that's um, that's how, how small those improvements are because they've made all of the development as they go through those other two stages of learning. They've, they've made all their improvements and now they're just at, right at the top. Um, you know, really getting diminishing returns, so just working for every small bit of improvement they can get. And if practice isn't maintained, um, that learner can slip back into the associative stage or phase of learning, which is um, really interesting to consider. Uh, practical examples. Um, so back to that badminton example. So the overhead clear is now performed consistently and fluent fluently with, with very little attention paid to its, its execution. It's automatic. Um, the learner can now spend more time focusing on strategic aspects of the game, such as, as I mentioned before, placing the shuttlecock or, or the, the shot selection that they're using mid-game. Teaching can also focus on minor improvements, such as tweaking hitting techniques, which 
can develop um, more power in the shop, which is again fighting for those um, tiny improvements that they can gain from wherever they can get them from. One of the most important aspects to consider during fits and pause in the stages of learning, and in fact in most theories of motor skill learning, is the need to give quality feedback. So we're going to have a closer look at um, the following four types of feedback, and, and just on this chart here you might like to try to work out um, exactly what each type of feedback is from, from the pictures aligned in the chart. So we're going to have a look at um, intrinsic feedback, extrinsic feedback, knowledge of performance, and knowledge of results. So intrinsic feedback refers to information received by the athlete as a direct result of producing movement through their kinesthetic senses. So these are feelings from their muscles, their joints, um, and their balance. So all, all of that um, uh, feeling that comes from their proprioceptors. Extrinsic feedback, on the, on the other hand, generally occurs after performance, and it's from someone other than the athlete, usually a coach, or it could be friends or family. Um, it is sometimes called augmented feedback, and it can also be provided by uh, through the use of video analysis. Extrinsic feedback can also be split into a further two categories, uh, and this is the knowledge of performance and knowledge of results. So knowledge of performance is information about the technique and the performance. This can be provided verbally from the coach or visually via video. This enables the athlete to establish a kinesthetic reference for the correct movement. For example, the analysis of a sprinter's action. So it's, uh, it's really gaining uh, um, a feel for what that movement was and, and you can begin to um, glean out a few errors or, or what the good feelings are on a successful attempt. Um, knowledge of results is simply information with regard to that uh, result of the athlete's performance. Um, was it a success? Was it a failure? What was the distance? What was the time of the performance? Um, so all of those things. Um, so that wraps up this video on uh, fits and positive stages of learning theory. Um, also touched on, a, on, on quite a bit of feedback. Uh, or oh, sorry, some aspects of feedback. Um, if you're in my class, please make sure you complete the WISC sheet uh, through Google Docs and we'll be discussing this um, at the next theory lesson. Cheers.